Are we in a, well, actually, we almost don't yeah, have to zoom on some stuff over, over <laughs> her head that looks interesting. I think we might be coming up on some sponges. Yeah, I encourage viewers uh, watching on Nautilus Live that the quad cam is, is something special. Uh, sort of see all these different perspectives on this cliff face and, and the ROVs at work. I encourage you, if you're not already oh, wow. watching the quad cam, to kind of toggle back. Looks like we've got some Rodanoridogorgia, we've got some Chrysogorgias, Hemichorallids, Paragorgias. Um, this is pretty amazing. We've got another Walteria sponge over there on the oh left. Oh my gosh, that's that's huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's got a it's got a skeleton right yeah. above it too. Oh, do we have the laser lights on? Ah, there we go. Thank yeah. you. Sorry, I think I, I asked for it off for the fish, and then I forgot to ask for it back on. Oh, <laughs> we've got a crinoid up there as well, it looks like. That's pretty amazing. You just have a timer on them that it just <laughs> turns them back on. <laughs> <you know. laughs> oh, wow, and look at that vase sponge as well. A Euplectelid vase. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, for those at home who um, who may be joining us, we have a, an amazing group of, of researchers and scientists ashore who help with a lot of our identifications and um, are extremely, extremely helpful. And, you know, thank you to all of them for their the work that they put in for this. Yes, mahalo and nui. Wow, this is, it keeps getting even better. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is so amazing to see it. And it's, looks like we're into pillow basalt substrate here. Not seeing as many intrusives, at least for the moment. Virginia, I know we've we've uh, talked about this before, but I'm I'm still trying to learn how do we okay. how do we determine how old some of these corals are? Yeah, um, so there's a couple different ways. I think the original way was to kind of um, look at the base of the coral um, and get still an moving. idea of um, the growth. No, we're not moving right now. The growth rate. Do you want to keep moving? Um, yeah, and you so do some of yeah. these corals grow in annual or like multiple year or 10 year rings. And so you can actually go through and you can date each one of those rings to get an idea of how much it grows annually. Um, and you can also date the middle and the end to get like sort of an idea of the lifespan. Um, and you can also get an idea if you've, if you've done that sort of analysis alongside um, like, like height, you can get, um, you can kind of map out sort of this like growth. Oh, I think those might be another paragorgid with zoanthids down the corner there, or parazoanthid um, on the corner there. Oh, yeah. um, but you or can get sort of a like li uh, lifetime to like the age to height Other sort corners? of sort of Maybe? area yeah. or graph, and then you can start you know these collections. You can start getting an idea of you know their age based on um, you know where they they fall on that plot after Maybe after many there, number yeah. of um, observations so see it. oh thanks is there a way i know we're not doing that sort of detailed analysis of the video as we're making mm -hmm. these passes but is there a way to kind of guess it uh what what age corals how old this uh, particular cliff face Please the corals growing on it might be um i can i can't guess that um it's you know one of the things is that it's very specific to each coral taxa um, yep. and not just you know larger group but sometimes the species as well oh wow um 
Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. And so, oh, this is interesting. That's another, looks like another bamboo. Um, are we at full zoom on this, Cool. Yeah, I can go in a dead one. Ooh. That's it. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. This is beautiful. It looks like a planer. I think there's Planer a little sea core. spider on it. You see that? Oh, oh you're right. Guy. Oh, good, good spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is interesting. Any relation to land spiders? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I don't think so. I think they're in slightly different groups. They're a type of crustacean, right? Uh, yeah. I thought they were true uh, arachnids. So I the picnogonids? Mm, yeah. I didn't think so. I think, um, well, I could be wrong. I can't remember now. Or are they anthropods? I think they're arthropods. Anyway, there's one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If we go back far That's enough, amazing. <laughs> we're all related. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it's another one where I'm. Hey. Awesome. I'm glad. Thank you. Yeah, it's so beautiful. Yeah, so they are considered anthropods. Are you internetting? <laughs> <laughs> I got curious. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Accidentally knocking my mic around back here. <laughs> <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, so we had a, um, uh, I think, Go back in? and check who it was. In? Yeah, Chris Kelly mentioned that this is uh, probably a Jason Isis, um, which is planar, and um, the polyps are filled with sclerites, which make them appear very dense and white, sort of, which is very similar to what we're seeing, which is pretty amazing. Oh, and there's a crinoid on the top of it as well. That's pretty cool. And that chrysochord shit in the background. These are all amazing. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And does the do we feel like it's the current and kind of this spot on these overhangs and this cliff face that's really uh, allowing these so many different corals to thrive, so much access to food here? Uh, that's my hypothesis. Um, you know that these rocks have been here for a long enough time. They've and the corals have been able to settle and grow um, and have had the, the food sources um, required. And, and all that requires currents. Um, that is stunning. Do these, uh, do these deep sea corals kind of spawn in ways that are similar to our shallow water sort of tropical reef corals? And is it a single polyp that might land very, on the substrate and eventually uh, give rise to this? to these larger coral structures? Uh, yeah, I think I think it is. It's a, it's a single polyp that will grow into this, these structures. Um, That's it's amazing. Uh, it's pretty amazing to think about um, the different, and the different methods that different coral taxa utilize to, to recruit. Um, it's pretty, Pretty astounding, actually. Um, I have a, uh, I have a friend who's actually studying reproduction in corals, and she's getting some very interesting results. 
is always great. Yeah, thanks, Virginia. I'm used to seeing, you know, oftentimes the effects uh, or, or coral spawn. We'll see uh, kind of large, large clouds. Um, oh, certain, wow. certain times of the of the month, usually associated with, I think, the lunar, the lunar uh, phases, yeah. and uh, it's That's pretty great. awesome to watch at the surface. But uh, so curious what that event looks like down in the depths. Yeah, that's something that a lot of researchers are studying. There are some, some corals. It's it's interesting actually. Um, there are some corals that seem seem to maintain some of that that pattern of of spawning seasonally, um, and then there are some corals that um, have gotten they're continuously spawning. You'll find different different coral within similar patches spawn it like with. Um, Basically, they'll look at like the egg oh, size, and the there. eggs will be of different yeah. sizes. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. Between the different oh. corals, and so that sort of is like, oh, these these are spawning at different times. I think so we see captain. another predation event. Yeah, There's a the sea star on the right with the bamboo the coral, a bunch of polyps. Yeah, cool. There's a bunch of bunch of polyps eaten off. Did you really? Yeah. Did you don't want to pan over to that? Uh, um, if can, but that's okay. Robert, can we pan, pan over to the right? I'm interested. What's going on back there? <laughs> I think, yeah, they were saying there was a predation event over here, a sea star. Yeah, yeah I think just off to the right. Yeah. You can see the skeleton, and I think that might be Are a, a problem back there? very big orange sea star towards the base. You can see all the polyps that are gone. So are we looking at the star? Yeah, yeah the sea star up in the corner. Yep, right there. Oh, that's interesting. Can wow. we uh, zoom in? Okay. Oh, yeah. Definite predation. Wow. That's pretty amazing. I think this this wow. is the mo this is definitely the most number of predation events I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. mm. There's good angle on it too. Yeah. Really. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Sorry, trying to get stable here. I got a little wide. We just need uh, Sir David Attenborough to come in and narrate the predation event. Just like <laughs> seriously, <laughs> yeah. Here in the deep sea. <laughs> we see the hungry sea star. Oh, yeah, wow. Right there. <laughs> to our viewer who asked That's what coral tastes like. All right, we got more zoom? Yep, there we go. Beautiful pet uh, star. So are we seeing part yeah. of its stomach out here? I think potentially, and you can also see that a lot of the, the polyps directly adjacent to the sea star have all closed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and some of them further out, like out here, they're open. That's really interesting. And you can see the branching pattern. This is a internodal branching. So it's not branching from a node, it's branching between nodes. Right, um, yeah. And it looks like this, there's a chance that this sea star has actually moved up this coral and is actually currently eating along this branch. It sure looks like that. Yeah, wow. it definitely does. That's amazing. Will these sea stars just kind of take up residence for very long periods of time while they kind of slowly consume all the polyps on these on these corals? You know, that is the thought process. Um, I think we had this discussion the other day of, you know, what would be the, why would they move? Yeah. You know? um, Free food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing, yeah. And you can, s it does look like it's got some of its stomach out. Um, it's amazing. Wow. So in that other coral where we saw um, the, it was 
it was like another coral was attaching to a skeleton. Uh, where was the, the yellow and the pink one together? Mm -hmm. In this situation where there's now an available skeleton, would another coral be able to attach here? Hmm. Right, yeah, now now that this uh, sea star has come through, it, and you can actually, it's kind of interesting, you know, you don't always see it. Yeah, actually here, you can see it. Oh. these, it's been uh, colonized, that skeleton has been colonized, and so um, that's that's one of the, the and so you've got this basket star on it as well, and you've got these hydroids. I was going to ask if those are hydroids. I mean, I, th I think so. That's what they look like, yeah, it's the right color yeah. for what we typically see. Right. So it's uh, it's pretty impressive, um, and so now it's it's available substrate for many other other organisms as well. Um, just yeah, so crazy, great. you know. Um, and I actually I don't know if uh, this would be a good substrate for the the parazoanthid. I'm I'm unsure if that parazoanthid utilizes any of the host nutrients or polyps as well. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting, so, but it's also in my head now, I'm like, okay, but these are now separate entities, right? Like these are, it's, it's closed off any, any nutrients between these polyps on mm -hmm. these different branches. Mm -hmm. That's amazing though. Oh, and we've got a, we've got a crinoid over here. It's wild. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing how much a single coral how important it can be for the rest of the organisms around it and um, such a habitat source and refuge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that might be a Ganiasterid uh, sea star, potentially a Pipasteria. Um, but yeah, that's pretty great. Wow, it's not every day that we see these um, predation events, honestly. It's actually very, it's actually very rare, um, even though I think we've seen one on every one of our seamount dives in this area. It does make me kind of wish that they, that this predation event sort of triggered spawning and they could just be like, oh, we're under attack and <laughs> they could just send their little larvae out into the out into the water, but I'm not sure. <laughs> pretty yeah. sure it doesn't work like that. But. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think it would depend on what type of spawners they are. Um, yeah. I actually don't know if anyone's doing research on bamboo coral reproduction. Um, Is it my amber? But okay, that's great. All wow, right. thank that's you so nice much. Shots. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Thank you guys. So you're saying for people looking for a PhD topic, it could be. Uh, Oh, absolutely. Could, could be one. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, these bamboo corals are so diverse and so very, so interesting, you know, and they, they have, they've, they've, tra it's, uh, the, it's sort of difficult to talk about because they've, they've changed the names and the, the structures of, of the corals and the clades and oh, it's gone through many processes of realizing that actually everything with black and white stripes the you know the these that have this bamboo shape actually are not um, all in the same group they're very very similar in, in appearance but they have very different other characteristics and so it's um, that that group of corals in particular is exceptionally interesting and there are i think there are researchers who are i know that there are researchers who spend a lot a lot of time on these bamboo corals
looks like we're back into uh, an area where we're seeing some uh, intrusive structures. So we're seeing a little bit more of the uh, volcanic plumbing around here. Yeah. Uh, right here? Mike oh yeah, it's got a very low. Another pick. Wait. No, that's like a squat lobster. Squat lobster. Wow, this is amazing on multiple chrysogorges, and you can see the the squat lobsters within the chrysogorges as well. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, Herc's heading. It looks like we're. Uh, pretty close to uh, uh, face on with some of these intrusives, which gives uh, those an approximate uh, orientation of about 260 degrees, which uh, okay. aligns fairly well with the uh, the rift zone structure that we're currently uh, moving up. Great. Yeah, so we've, uh, Steve Oskovich has uh, let us know that this uh, squat lobster is a Munodopsis gochani, um, which is often seen on hydroids like this, which is pretty interesting. Um, there are several there are several organisms out there that seem to live exclusively or almost exclusively um, on some of these different corals and, and um, as well as sponges and these hydroids and such. And um, it's always it's always really interesting. So, are we looking at two different species of squat lobster there? Uh, I believe. So. I, I believe so, I think, okay. um, just based on the face structure and, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting. That is great, yeah. And you can see the delicate branching of the chrysocorgia as well, which is always wonderful. Looks like a cranoid in the background, mm -hmm. as well as a up from Yeah, so that's wonderful. Yeah. Should yeah. probably get a move on and keep uh, heading oh, up yeah. this cliff here. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for the zoom. Yeah, yeah thank you. Amazing okay. job, front row Come and back, back row. Another bump up slope here. Bridge now. Could we please move two five meters at bearing two nine zero? Thank you. The current's starting to pick up again. Yeah. We're getting. Oh, yeah, we can see it in the marine snow a little bit back here. Look, it, is it, it looks like it's going to try to push us into the wall. Yeah. Okay. It's not bad yet, but okay. I just noticed it is picking up. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Hey, Virginia, take a look at this. Just beautiful. Yeah. There's some wow, big yeah, corals here. Wow, yeah, that is amazing. These are beautiful. Mm -hmm. Looks like we've got some more corallids. Uh, corallids, par uh, paragorgids. Wow, if we could get a zoom on this. That would be amazing. That is enormous. Is that right. huge Christ of Gorgia? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think it is. It's well, it's that or it's a. Wow, look at that whirl formation. Beautiful. And several squat lobsters. Mm. That's the hangout spot. Sure is. Wow, there's so, and crinoids. God. These chrysogorgids are just some of my absolute favorite to find because they can host so many other organisms.
Yeah, it's just a little village for so many other, yeah, so many other sure creatures. Is. That's amazing. Yeah, I think we've got multiple chrysogorges here, which is. Yeah, we do. Look at all the base formations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That's all right. incredible. That's amazing. <laughs> the Chrysogorgia Palace over here. It this is. is pretty awesome. Oh, and a crinoid. Oh, that's stunning. seems like so many of these small communities, like they almost just become, through their mutualisms, as hosting on the Chrysogorgia, just mm -hmm. one organism is <laughs> full of all of these uh, <laughs> sort of different different creatures. Yeah. I know the squat lobsters will bounce around a bit, but it's just incredible. Great shot with the dark background. You can really just see the shape and color of the polyps. Mm -hmm. Beautiful polyps. Thanks for positioning like this rubber is perfect. Yeah, that's spectacular. Oh wow. Yeah. With the pericorchid in the background too. <laughs> Amazing. Mm -hmm. That's stunning. Imagine you can check our Instagram page later for some of these photos. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. Yeah, these are just incredible. Just incredible and the polyps on those. That's such an incredible zoom. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mahalo Kanaloa. We've spoken about this yes. before, Mahina. These are, uh, you know, foundational family going back mm -hmm. to the beginning of uh, Hawaii and Hawaiians and our human Kanaka and, and more than human family. It reaches all the way back into the depths of Papahanaumokuakea mm -hmm. yeah. to these beautiful corals. Yeah, most definitely. Sorry, Dan. No, just amazing to see them supporting life, continuing to support such incredible abundance in life. Yeah. Hawaiian mo'oku oha, or Hawaiian genealogy, especially the genealogy or the beginning and inception of our Hawaiian universe and consciousness, it starts within these depths, in these kai'uli, uh, the darkest parts of the ocean. Um, we come from the ko'a, the coral, and then, you know, have evolved uh, as life has evolved on land too, simultaneous, simultaneously and just having this connection. And as we see here, and I love learning from um, Virginia and Dr. Val, uh, all of these uh, creatures and coral structures have associates living on them and coexisting on them. And so it's just a great statement as to how nature, how so many things within these natural worlds can coexist with one another. Um, you know, the cycle, it's just amazing to see how they benefit one another or live off of one another and how they survive and then thrive and flourish, especially at these harsh depths where it's so cold and dark and the pressure is so great. Absolutely, Mahina. Oh wow, that's an amazing view of that spot lobster too. Mm -hmm. So what's this? Is that like a mollusk or something? 
Could be, could be an egg case as well. Could be an anemone oh, okay. that's uh, inside. Um, I've been told that there actually are several things that will put their egg cases inside of corals. Okay. Oh. And since uh, viewers can't see the telestrator, I'm talking about the pale yellow uh, mm -hmm. round thingy on the uh, coral that just went out of the frame. You know, I've never been able to zoom in quite like this on one of these um, these crustaceans. It's, it om I mean, it looks like the way that it, those, it's hooked, the, its legs are hooked around these corals. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's pretty astounding. It, it, ma it makes you wonder if this is this true, if it was adapted just for this specific coral. I mean, it's, it's amazing to see. Crustacean foot morphology. We need to we need to study it. What's another PhD? The, Could easily be one. Yeah. How they're holding on. <laughs> I think there's a shrimp. Oh, what is that? Uh, we're on the far right side of the screen. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's an isopod. isopod. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So much life dancing about in these corals. These chrysogorgias, amazing. Yeah, it is. Sometimes it just takes, you know, sitting and being still and getting a really close look to find some of this really small scale diversity and so the, it's pretty amazing, you know, every, probably every single one of these corals that we see has, have associates with them, you know, so whenever we do studies, we're Oh, yeah. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, whenever we do these studies, oh, that's an interesting shrimp. Whenever we do these studies, um, there's so much more around, so, but, um, yeah, that's an awesome zoom, so we can, we can move on when. Okay. Yep. yep. Get a little bit further up this cliff face. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that incredible yeah. tour, Virginia, Aww. and uh, all of our front row. Amazing. So nice to get lost in there. Yeah. <laughs> so we have about an hour left in our watch. So uh, we're going to keep heading up this uh, uh, cliff face, this poly, toward our modified waypoint three. And uh, we're going to be keeping a very close eye on uh, how the current changes as we ascend. So and, uh, just kind of uh, ascend, assess, rinse, repeat. Uh, try to make our way up this uh, unnamed seamount number 17, soon to be given a proper name. I wonder what it'll be. Yeah, me too. I hope the uh, cultural working group over at NOAA and Papahanaumokuakea has a, has a say and, and, and gets to lead the way in that. They're doing an outstanding job naming. Uh, I believe they are agreed. involved, yeah. I think that would be so fantastic. Names definitely possess power, and Kanako Eevee believes that this power har is harnessed each time when spoken. Um, mm -hmm. I know one of our previous dives, when we had our blue water segment, we were all speaking about just the reclaiming of um, indigenous spaces through the indigenous or native tongue, uh, the native language, and how that empowers the people, it empowers the place. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> That's really great. Looks like another, um... Is it back up? Although the Hawaii and Hawaiian language um, can be very descriptive, and so I think some of our terms used to uh, describe what we see in marine life and even life on land can be very descriptive, very precise. Any manao on that, Kukui? On names? 
yeah. in Olalo, Hawaii? Names in Olalo, Hawaii in general, I mean, with sea creatures or uh, with crops and plants. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. Beautiful mana'o, Mahina. And yeah, I totally agree. There's so much description that um, one can see in, o in Olalo, Hawaii. And I think you were talking about earlier how sometimes these names also have kona, deeper meanings, mm -hmm. and it relates to so many things. And there could be so many um, similar things that one can use the same description of. But at the same time, um, with each and everything, there's also a deeper kona behind why they were named that specific name. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, beautiful mana'o. Mahalo nui mahina. Yeah, of course. And, you know, even with the names that we're given, um, most times it's very common in our culture to have an inoa po or um, a name that comes to you in, at night while you dream. And so many of us, myself included, um, my name comes from this. Um, oftentimes it's a, a parent or a family member who may dream prior to your birth, but um, and a name might come to them while they're sleeping in their dreams. And then, um, if so, then it's very important, it's imperative that that child is given that name. So, like Kukui had also mentioned, there's a lot of other kauna, hidden meaning behind a name, um, similarities. Yeah, like, uh, um, like, for example, like a lot of the sea creatures have, um, when we, when people develop names for these sea creatures, you'll also um, oftentimes see them use in other instances, like a, pe a sea star. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Mahina Pe'a also means sail. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's really interesting to see the kind of like how they came up with that terminology for a sail mm -hmm. and a sea creature at the same time. Yeah. yeah. I, do you have any mana on why that may, why that may be or how they would use certain descriptions mm -hmm. to name certain things? Mm, not necessarily. I know va'a related, uh, canoe related, um, one of our steering blades on the canoe, Ahoy Uli. Ahoy is a paddle and then Uli as we've mentioned because our name of our expedition is actually Ala Omwana Kai Uli. Uli can mean a spectrum of blue. Um, it could mean the, the depths of the ocean, the depths of the sea. Um, as, you know, Daniel has mentioned before, our oceans and our Mwana Nuyakea is a archive. It's a place of knowledge. It's a realm, a sacred realm of our ancestors. So on board when we're steering, um, oftentimes, or this, this part of the canoe, this tool used on the canoe is called a Hoi Uli. Beautiful. I, and there's so many uh, places that are that have names that are given names are often um, their characteristics are often used in the naming of that place. Uh, there's a place on Maui, for example, called uh, uh, people call it Thousand Peaks, um, but it, its traditional name, I believe, was Pa Koa, and Pa Koa refers to the touching of the koa or the coral on the water because it's oftentimes so shallow over there, and so that's why I believe there it was given the name Pa Koa. Oh, wow. And so a lot of times on, yeah, like Mahino was saying on these expeditions, um, a lot of mana'o goes, or thought goes into these naming processes, like uh, what the objectives are, where they're going, um, what they're doing it for, and the reason behind it. So yeah, a lot of mana'o goes into to naming, to naming not only uh, uh, people, but also places and things that we oftentimes see. Yeah. And this is another beautiful uh, Eric orchid with that uh, sea star on it. And you can see a Chrysogorgia in the background with their uh, the squat lobster. That is awesome. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And it's interesting, it actually looks like this uh, Paragorsha once broke slightly, but it's st has, um, it's still alive, which is pretty amazing, so that's pretty great. Um, awesome, thanks. I think this is yeah. great for us, so yeah. we can move on when y'all are ready. Mm -hmm.
give Adelant another little nudge. She didn't yeah. move, move very much on the last one. We have a question from an online viewer asking about if there are different accents within the Hawaiian language or from island to island. And yes, actually, um, Olelo is spoken differently on island. I feel like more uh, today in our time, it's more homogenized um, because we go to the same institutions, especially for higher education, and learn Olelo Hawaii or Hawaiian language there. Um, but pre-contact, um, every island had, there were, I'd say, more um, significant differences in Olelo. And we even followed it a different um, Hawaiian lunar calendar. And so for our lunar calendar, I mean, we all followed uh, the moon and the stars very closely. And that also kind of signified um, optimal days for fishing, farming, harvesting, etc. cetera. Um, but from island to island, we had different names for the same phase of the Hawaiian moon. So tonight is actually Hilo, uh, Pomahina Hilo. So it is the beginning of our, of our Hawaiian, our new Hawaiian lunar month. I, and also, um, it's really interesting to hear, um, yeah, people okay. across the Paia'ina speak you. Hawaiian. Um, people from the island of Ni'iho also have a very distinct dialect as well. And um, also, even um, going to other uh, secondary, post-secondary education institutions, um, sometimes they have different spellings and different diacritical marks um, that they use um, among institutions. Um, from what I hear from some of my friends who attend um, Manoa and um, Kahakaula Ke'elikolani at Hilo, um, sometimes their, their spellings may differ as well, but yeah, it's pretty much, um, the structure is pretty much um, the same, the accents are pretty much the same. Um, and when you go to Ni'iho, then that's when you start to hear um, differences in accents as well, as well as different letters being used. Most definitely. And you can say with... Uh very similar with Hawaiian Crow English too, otherwise known as Pigeon. Yes, um, every single island has a slightly different uh, term, terminology, lingo, words used to describe many things. Yeah, even among uh, generations, sometimes uh, you see different words being developed um, within that, that same mm -hmm. language, that same language structure, but um, different generations um, oftentimes end up uh, using different words for different things as well. It just goes to show how language is always evolving. Oh. Wow, that's a lot of Christ gorgeous. Oh, wow. These are stunning. Oh, wrong one. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, would it be possible to get a zoom on one of them and then kind of quickly move back up? Can you zoom it? All the way over to the right, fortunately. And that lonesome parrot orchid? Uh, yeah, it looks like an. Oh, I haven't corralled it. Get a zoom too, Sam, ever. I don't uh, see the bonus. Take a zoom too. I can't. Zoom in. Um, on this? Yeah. I'm um, sorry, can I finish one first? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, I'm full zoom on Hercules. Mm -hmm. I was running out of hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the branching structure of these is pretty amazing. It's um, definitely still spiraled stalks. Oops. 
and they're much larger. Um, and they still have that squat lobster, the Eurocticus curostylida uh, squat lobster. Oh, several of them. That's amazing. That's an awesome zoom. Or awesome view, yeah. It's always so wonderful to see such uh, such beautiful corals here. Great, that's amazing. Thank you. We can. Yeah. Awesome. It's amazing to see such a dense cluster of them as well. All on this rock face or this outcrop here. That's pretty stunning. Wow. And we've got some uh, paragorges there as well. Here. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah, it looks like actually we've got we've got a another forest of these coming up as well. That's pretty amazing. They're on this. We've got some here as well as some here too. And it looks like it comes up. Not that we have to go see them, but that's, um, that's an amazing continuation of these, this Chrysocorgia. Sack was noting a uh, change in fauna. What did I miss? Sorry? Uh, Asaka's noting a change in uh, fauna. Did, uh, was there something that I missed? Oh, um... Oh, no. Uh, I mean, the Crazy Gorges have changed um, okay. a little bit, but I think... Uh, I guess we're fewer of the bamboos. Um, and actually, I guess, yeah, the few of the bamboos and the hemichorallids, and now we've moved into far more chrysogorgias. And that's actually interesting, too, because I, I associate chrysogorgias with areas that can take a little bit um, as with have a little bit more sediment moving around, too. Hmm. Um, that just comes from, you know, past experiences of seeing seeing some chrysogorgias in areas where you don't think you would. Oh, look at that squat swimming <laughs> around in that paragorgia. That's amazing. Awesome. Thank you for such a great view. Mm -hmm. We can uh, we can keep moving though. Great. Thank you though. Do you mean we're gonna head upslope this way to get out in front of Atalanta? Yeah, I should probably go more upslope and we'll turn more into it. I'll also know that, and this may or may not be connected to that uh, change in fauna, um, we're seeing what seems to be a lot less uh, debris, more and uh, almost entirely in place rock here. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you're right. We've got some crinoids and another sponge. Oh, and a, looks like a pseudoanthomastis on top of a stalk. It's pretty amazing. Maybe another small Walteria there on the left. Um, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think. Uh, we 
zoom in. Yeah, what's this mushroom coral just doing, mm -hmm. hanging just out on hanging an old stock? On stock? Yeah. Got to get creative sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's one of those pseudoanthomasses because they've got a shorter stock. But, okay. Um, but I'm also, you know, it's growing in a pretty unique oh, area, so it might not be. Did you see a little crinoid swim by on the left? Oh, no. No, I missed it. I looked down at the that's wrong That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Let's switch yeah. over to survey and see where we are. Yeah, still about two thirds or so of this uh, slope to go before the next waypoint. Yeah. Yeah, it just gave us another ship move to awesome. keep us heading up there. Sounds great. Um, Virginia, I have a question about the color of the corals from one of our viewers uh, about the predominance of white or the absence of pigment. Mm. Is that due to the lack of sunlight at this depth? Um, and what are the accounts for the colors of the pink and the reds that we're seeing? Yeah, so there's been a lot of topic on cor on coral color um, because they are so vibrant. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I've learned on this, this trip actually is that um, uh, someone was saying that these corals, a lot of them have, um, have dif distant sort of relatives that were in the shallow spaces and so they um, and they didn't, they didn't lose their, their colors. Um, another, another important, and so, and so instead of, you know, they didn't lose their colors and so they still have these pretty vibrant colors. Um, and that's, that's something you, you, you get a lot of those questions too when you see the very, very beautiful purple corals. Um, and then also, you know, these, these pink and red, do you remember that, you know, um, red corals, anything that's red in the deep sea is, is very difficult to see. Um, and it, it might do a really good job of blending into its background, um, which could could be beneficial. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting because I don't know if anyone can has really studied exactly that that evolutionary um, those evolutionary adaptations or or um, reasonings, but it's they are absolutely stunning. That is true. Mahalo, thank you so much for your EPA, your knowledge. And thank you for tuning in with us. Those of you who are joining us, we are on the exploration vessel Nautilus in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument on a currently unnamed uh, sea mount. And we're just diving and seeing all of these beautiful ridges. We have people tuning in from the United States, Canada, UK, Germany, Palau, Philippines, Norway, Netherlands, Mexico, Italy, Finland, Spain, Denmark, Australia. Mahalo, thank you so much for viewing and exploring the depths of the Kaiuli, the ocean with us. Yeah, so um, actually Asako uh, just uh, let me know that, oh, there's a Rodana, a Ritogorgia, um, that um, actually Paragorgia and Hemichoralliums have coral, have colors um, in their sclerites. And so, um, mm -hmm. which is sort of the skeletal structure that makes that's um, uh, that makes up the coral skeleton. But for the acidids um, and some and some chrysogorgids, the color is actually in their tissue. Oh. Um, as well, primnoids have color in their tissue. So some of the colors might come from the different, um, you know, different methods that they're using to support their skeleton as well, which is just wild. Mm -hmm. There's so many different. So many different ways to be a coral in the deep sea. <laughs> what coral would you be? If I could be any coral, mm -hmm. oh, I would love to be a Chrysogorgia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're so beautiful. Um, but nothing elaborate, you know, maybe just a, <laughs> maybe just a bottle brush, Chrysogorgia, you know, the geniculata, or, you know. I don't, I don't need to be an Eritogorgia or a, you know, one of the spirally ones. Just, just mm -hmm. happy being a, you know. What about y'all? Which core would you want to be? I think I would be uh, a Canthagorgia. Mm. Mixing mm. everybody up, or mixing <laughs> me up. It mixes me up all the time. <laughs>
Victor Gorgia too flamboyant? <laughs> <laughs> no, that'd be great. You'd make a great Victor Gorgia. <laughs> I think I'd like to be one of the little shrimps living inside them. It seems cozy in there. Mm. Oh, yes. I want to be one of those little shrimps with the uh, with sponges. <laughs> <laughs> Would y'all live? Oh. What was that, Amber? You get like a nice big glass house. Ooh, Ooh yeah. yeah. <laughs> but which house would you live in, a sponge or a coral? I think a sponge. Yeah, yeah. the sponge. Fewer things are eating it. Yeah. You got a minute here. I still think I'd be the rock. Yeah, <laughs> Spoken like a true geologist. <laughs> yeah. Zach, what coral or um, oh, wow, sunny. Um, what coral would you be? Or critter. Critter. Mm. Oh, critter. I actually like subtropical. Pet coral, so probably a pectinia, because I love pectinias, the spiny cup corals. Oh, oh, nice. I actually have a few in my aquarium at home. And wow. You have a saltwater aquarium? Yep, I have a salt wow. and a planet aquarium. I do wow. cichlids, uh, planet aquarium, and uh, my pride and joy is my reef tank. I, just, I do a lot of uh, stony hard coral. That's awesome. A lot of chalices, yeah. euphilias, pectinias, and uh, some clams. Ooh. How big is this thing? Oh, it's a 62 gallon, 65 gallon, I think. A cube? Yeah. Two by two? Two no, by two it, by two? It's like a four by, no, no, not four. It's like a three by two by 16, 18, something like that. It's a weird shape. And then I have another one I have in, whole, in my garage. It's a, it's one I hand built. It's wow. a, it's a four by, the four foot by three foot by eighteen inches tall. And that oh, one wow. I've been kind of holding on to for a big project later. I had a saltwater aquarium until about a year ago. I just got too nervous because I'm. I don't live with anybody else, so by myself, so it was all automated. <laughs> I'd go away. I could be away for two months, and that wow. tank survived because it had a it continuously changed water out. Oh, it had yeah. 200 gallons of fresh seawater. Oh yeah. So it continuously had a dual head peristaltic pump to oh, wow. transfer oh, okay. the yeah. water continuously. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All around a mine. Very complicated tank. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty complicated. Mine's pretty simplistic. Too many, too many things can go wrong. And <laughs> yeah, if you're not around. Disastrous consequences. Mm -hmm. I gave it up. No, mine's pretty simplistic. I got a algae turf scrubber and a protein skimmer, and that's Just it. I, I pay some, a, I've had a roller mat filter that yeah. continuously rolls the yeah. used mat up. Yep. Yeah. Oh wow. And so yeah, I got. It was my, pretty fancy. I got one of those and. Uh, like I said, the algae turf scrubber, it it kind of, what it is is that you, you kind of grow uh, nuisance type algaes inside of it using uh, high bright LEDs and the yeah. thought process behind yeah, it. Yeah, a refugium. Yep, it, it acts like a refugium, but yeah. it uses uh, green hair algae instead of uh, Kato, uh, Calerpa, and stuff yeah. like that. And so right. We're out here talking about saltwater tanks in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. The irony. <laughs> yeah, I know, right. You got this great big one here that takes care of itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so wonderful to like, understand that process even more deeply, understanding awesome. the chemistry of it all. Thank you. Yeah. I really admire how you can do yeah. those things. So, yeah, so like, back to it again. My, my aquarium, it kind of takes care of itself. I don't do any water changes on it, which is, you know, some frown upon it, but I mean, the way my system works, like, like the, the turf scrubber itself, you know, it sucks up all the nutrients and, you know, you, you don't have to, in theory, have to do water changes. And I mean, if, if I do, it's usually because I dose something um, or accidentally overfeed or someone overfeeds or something like that. Some, something going on with it. And it's usually the only time I ever do water changes, but other than that, it takes care of itself. 
You'll have to show me some pictures if you have I'll them. show you some pictures. Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I have to ask my wife to take a big blown up picture because I'm, I have some of the <laughs> of my corals. <laughs> that's it. Because <laughs> I do have a chalice that's like that big I got from that. And it's like a big old, almost small dinner plate size. It was a big key. Mm -hmm. Speaking of corals, um, oh, wow. we have uh, another viewer or two kind of curious about coral bleaching at this depth. Has it been seen? Have any of you folks experienced it? Virginia? One moment. Yeah. Sorry. No worries. Sorry, what? Sorry. Um, we have one of the, a viewer just joining us, and they're just kind of wondering about um, coral bleaching, if you've noticed it or experienced it, especially at this depth. Yeah. So, um, oh, wow. Look at this cliff face of <laughs> corals. Um, so coral bleaching is actually a pretty uniquely um, shallow um, uh, yeah, phenomenon, thank you. Uh, <laughs> for some reason, I was like, event, but that's not quite right either. Um, and that occurs actually when the um, symbiotic um, symbiodinium uh, algae within the corals that are, are so, so important for um, uh, getting nutrients from the sunlight so that the corals can also, you know, create their structure and such and are so important for the corals. When those get so stressed out that they actually, um, and the corals themselves are expelled from the coral. Mm -hmm. And so the corals no longer have that, the coloration from the symbiodinium anymore. And so you get these white bleached corals. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's due to, um, a lot of the times due to heat. Wow, that is a stunning sponge in front of us. Mm -hmm. um, and so these corals here, um, they don't have that same um, symbiosis with, uh, with an algae. Um, and so the, um, the white corals that we see here, that's, that's not any bleaching event um, due to heat. So there, but there are different phenomenons in the, and, and events occurring um, and environmental changes happening in the deep sea that could be affecting these corals as well. Um, and that could either be, um, you know, there's been changes in pH that have been observed in um, the, the depths where we see some of these corals um, between like 500 and 2000 meters. I think they, they've seen a, a drop in pH as well as, um, you know, and that can be, th that's uh, o ocean acidification, which would be affecting some of these corals. Um, and there has been some change in temperature that's been observed. Yeah, I think go. there's predicted to be more of Up both of those things here. that could in the future really impact these corals. Um, and I think, you know, we do Head see, we've seen a lot of uh, rubble patches and, and areas where there is that, that white Water. white yeah. corals in places. Um, and that could be to, to any number of right um, natural environmental faster. changes as well as potentially Absolutely. some yeah, um, some some climate anthropogenic induced climate changes as well so um but also it's one of the reasons why baseline studies like this where we go and we we f we look at um communities that haven't been looked at seamounts that haven't been found um in in areas that maybe are, are understudied why this is so important because you know you can come back here in a couple of years as climate change and and environmental pressures have um, increased in these areas and you can come back and you can say okay this is what we saw several years ago when the environmental conditions looked like this are we seeing the same thing mm -hmm. and you can also take some of the same in situ environmental um, uh, data like right now Hercules is taking I believe temperature and salinity which are some pretty important factors and so you can come back and look and see if you've got those same same or different environmental factors and then look at the communities as well so it's it's always really exciting to do these kinds of studies and just you know see what we see because it it's important for right now and it's also important for the future as well wonderful mm -hmm. wow mahalo thank you thank mm -hmm. you virginia i hope i actually answered the question in that i'm not positive yes okay great <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
This is stunning. We've got um, some Chrysogorgia geniculata. We've got some Aritogorgia, some Rodana Aritogorgia, um, several sponges in here, as well as all the. I have to keep the name of this squat lobster up because I have a hard time pronouncing it. Veropticus chryso, the chirocylid. Um, this looks like a in? beautiful euplectid sponge. Although I could be wrong about it being euplectelid. Um, with something inside of it. Ooh, looks like several. Uh, yeah, watch yourself. You're hitting your upper Several rock. somethings. Um, like isopods or shrimp? Yeah, inside? I'm not. I'm not sure if they're um, uh, amphipods or shrimps. So, and those look like true, true white uh, galathea squat lobsters. Um, this is pretty amazing. Let's try that again. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know when you're ready. Okay. Can you zoom in again? Zoom in. Yes, oh. there is much mahalo on the internet, Virginia, oh. for the, <laughs> the greatly detailed and insightful answer about oh, the great. coral. So, mahalo, oh, mahalo. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, they could also be... We have one vote for anemone associates as well, but it's kind of hard to s to see these light pink. That's interesting. About to be right above you again, Robert. Yeah. And beautiful chrysoporches. Right, not run into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty amazing um structure for that sponge we don't often I don't know if I've seen a sponge that looks quite like that actually okay I don't think it's in our it's not in our collection guide though so that's good mm -hmm. wow that is beautiful and Several okay. spot lobsters. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Coming up. Another big sponge there. Oh wow! Yeah, another beautiful sponge. Zoom. I think it may be a hexac hexactenelid sponge. Yeah. Yeah. Sponge. It could also be wrong too. We've got just one little squat hanging out in there. Yeah, sure enough. Mm -hmm. Wow, these are beautiful. We have one viewer who wants to know if it if they can if it's safe to pet a squat lobster. <laughs> safe to pet a squat lobster. <laughs> Squat lobster, think? honestly, probably. Uh, they could hold a pencil. Uh, you know, but yeah, I'm not. I mean, a lot of these, they're pretty small. They're pretty small, some of these. How do you so. train them to hold a pencil? And <laughs> 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 just really make them suffer them through of school. The coral. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things you give a, a crab or something like this a pencil and they will just hold it. Um, um, not that I, but I do not recommend um, bothering any of these creatures on the seafloor. Um, don't recommend uh, diving down there to try to pet one. No, I do not. Yeah, I, do I don't not. think you'd have a very good time. Yeah. I think there's a fish down here too. Yeah. yeah. So those do cool. tend to survive the trip up, though. Oh, the wow. squat lobster is resilient, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they Even are. Even the shrimps too. Yeah. I think we had a last collection. One of the shrimps was actually alive in the wood yeah. lab. Yeah. <laughs> Looking at a pretty big intrusion here that is pretty heavily colonized. Wow. 
Yeah, that is stunning. And it looks like it's had at least a couple of generations of colonization on it, looking at all these empty holdfasts. Yeah, it's got several sizes of similar corals, too. You've got the Cressigorgia geniculata and um, some of the Rodana ritigorgias on the bottom there as well. These are pretty stunning. Wow. What an amazing sight. Oh, and it looks like a Paragorgia in the back too. And look at, you can see all these holdfasts here of yeah. lost, lost corals as well. And that can be to any number of things, including the fact that, you know, I mean, there could just be boulders that rolled down here too. Um, but that's pretty amazing. Big sponge over here. Ooh. Wow. It's so oh cool. my gosh. I think there's something in it. Is that another one of those base sponges Can you zoom in? that we saw earlier? So, yeah. It's like a coral inside that sponge. Oh, I wonder if oh it might. Oh, oh, look, it looks like it broke off. Oh, Like yeah. it broke off from Caught above. Yeah. Sure enough. And it fell in here. I didn't do it. No. <laughs> <laughs> and it still has an associate on it and everything. Right. Hmm. So it's just hanging out there, apparently thriving. I mean, it could, honest. I mean, I have yeah. no idea. It could just survive. I mean, it, it, it's not like it has a root system. It needs to survive, so. Not that I know of. It seems like that's I a good place yeah. for it. Maybe wow, the base sponge great. even helps uh, attract yeah, a little Yeah, probably a lot of flow right there. Yeah. Thanks yeah. to the sponge. Well, and sponges can create their own. Some, some sponges can create some of their own flow as well, so. Yeah, yeah. That coral might just be happy sitting there living in its lane, you know, flourishing. Might have been like the tumbling, so might have done it on purpose. <laughs> Maybe like the tumbling snail instead it's the tumbling, <laughs> tumbling Chrysogorgia. Chrysogorgia. <laughs> there I go making up species mm -hmm. again. Great, did you build? Mm -hmm. Oh wow. Yeah, what a spectacular dive. I've been running back and forth between ship to shores, but then um, we normally share a lot of other media from the ship on those interactions, but just been turning yeah, over to the live stream. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. Wow. That is a beautiful pet. Uh, beautiful starfish. Yeah. Wow. And it's got, what, a crab or another Star. squat lobster next to it? I can't tell yet. Yeah, oh, one. having a hard one. Oh, yeah. Having a hard time seeing it. Oh, yeah, that's a real. That's a, a large squat lobster. Okay. Um, wow. Oh, who need those? That is a gorgeous rock, Dr. Val. What a... Yeah, it is, it is yeah. Right. So that's that's another dike uh, okay. that we're seeing uh, exposed here by the uh, 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 collapse that happened a long time ago. And I can mm -hmm. see that there is a fair amount of manganese crust on this too, and it's been polished over time. Mm. So it, again, uh, I, more field evidence for uh, uh, this this, uh, this mass wasting crab. event or events uh, happening Is it many millions crab? of years ago. Yeah, that's a, that looks like a, <laughs> a crab. crab crab? Yeah, yeah, yeah a big crab. crab. Wow. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, it looks, like, it looks like it's missing a leg or two. Crustaceans Aww. are cool. They are cool. I'm labeling this crab crab. <laughs> <laughs> What do we think? Does it have four legs or three legs on each side? It's missing a Looks leg. Looks like three. Yeah. yeah. You can oh, definitely yeah. see where one is missing. Uh, yeah, you can oh, see yeah. the puka. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Mm. It could be a Paralomus a species. Wow. Or some other type of crab. Yeah. If it does only have three walking legs, then it's probably in the king crab uh, group. Really? I see four little slots for their maybe legs, or two extra slots. Yeah, I see a claw, a leg, and a leg, and then there was a, maybe a lost leg too, but yeah, that's good. That's awesome. Thank you right. for that view. Beautiful.
<laughs> wow. Look at this. Man, that rock structure is just incredible. It is, yeah. So polished. Mm -hmm. The cuts on it, it's yeah. gorgeous. Wow. We see those uh, fields of hold fast. I, I wasn't, right. uh, yeah, that's just evidence of uh, kind of a, a history just of colonization for, by corals over time, and some of those colonies mm -hmm. have just died out, and but this would have, uh, this would have been maybe colonized over a long period of time? Is oh, that, I, is that I what would, the presence of those suggests? I would imagine, I mean, if, if this formation has been here for ages, so um, it, it could just be that these corals have been growing around for a long time. Oh, that's some sort of anemone. Is that oh, a flytrap yeah. anemone? It, uh, I can't tell if it's a flytrap anemone or just a weird looking regular anemone, to be honest. Um, Yeah, so a lot of these corals, if, if this if this habitat has been here for a while and the, the currents haven't changed, then um, then the f this would be a phenomenal habitat for multiple generations of these corals. And, um, you know, you can see a lot of size differences among some of the similar looking taxa and uh, along with the holdfast, you could, you could, um, I would think that this would be potentially like it's oh, oh my gosh. gosh. Yeah. Oh, Look at all the basket stars. Incredible view. You can oh see gosh. in the Atalanta yeah. view. Uh, Check out these basket wow. stars just kind of oh. hanging out on the very tops of the uh, uh, corals. Yeah. What a, what wow. Come up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. What a view. It's on almost Atalanta. haunting on the Atalanta. Look at some, look at some of these yeah. very large Mm -hmm. Very large corals and, and basket stars. Wow. This is like overhang here. Yeah. Yeah, this looks like oh, part oh of another way. dike. <laughs> wow. And the uh, the dikes seem to be that is pretty uh, resistant rock here, so they're uh, generating uh, what well, looks like a lot of very advantageous uh, structures uh, that uh, all these animals are calling home. Absolutely, what I needed was uh, this this dive with all of you in the control van. Mm -hmm. Thank you for all of your knowledge, skill, and bringing this to us. Mm -hmm. Front row is absolutely incredible views, and back row, so much knowledge. And you can, thank you. This is amazing. It seems like we're clear. Maybe I can bump Adelina up a little bit. Yeah. Online viewers still feeling for crab crab. <laughs> <laughs> that friend has crab seen crab. some things and done some time, says, says oh. our online viewers. Indeed. Wow. Well. We were talking about saltwater aquariums. I actually had one when I was uh, a regular on the Atlantis. I had one on the ship. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. You did That's not. Cool. Oh. Yeah. Would it flash with the, you know, <laughs> on the, it wasn't, the no, it was It wasn't a very big tank, but it wouldn't splash around too much. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. What did you keep in there, Robert? Uh, I just had a few fish. It wasn't a very impressive aquarium. But the problem was <coughs> they'd sometimes get um, critters out of the uh, seawater strainer and donate them to my tank. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> often those critters weren't, like, really compatible. Uh -oh. uh, Oh. Had some issues there. <laughs> Ultimate fighting championship yeah. aquarium. Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. I, I wasn't really happy with them doing that. Should we get a pet master shirt for the ship? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mantis shrimp keeping you up all night. Oh, <laughs> I know. Why do they make noises? 
Well, what it is that uh, mantis shrimp have a club, <laughs> and if they don't, well, they're pretty territorial too. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way they hunt is that they use this club, and they just break it, knock it out, whatever. And whenever they hit, yeah, it breaks the sound barrier yeah. so right, fast, yeah. that it yeah. makes a yeah. snapping sound. Yeah. So, yeah, so they'll hit a, <laughs> hit a clam shell or crab shell, and they'll literally just hear, and oh my gosh. or you get pistol shrimps. I used to have a little uh, <laughs> mini micro pistol shrimp in the middle of the night. Here, all of a sudden, you hear, <laughs> <laughs> you're just like, what is that? <laughs> Lousy roommate, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've always dreamed of an aquarium, but it it's, takes a lot to do. Yeah, it's it's sort of an urchin there. Oh, yeah, there. Or it could be a, a tube anemone within oh, the Oh, yeah, maybe. It's kind of hard to tell unless you can get a good. Um, yeah, could we zoom on that real quick? Yeah, you zoom are. in. Awesome. Yeah, I don't think that's an urchin. Yeah, no, that looks <laughs> like a, a tube anemone. Um, there are a couple of them that will create um, a tube from their mucus and they'll kind of stay buried partially within that um, sediment. They're pretty cool. Um, they're pretty common in, uh, in sandy areas as well as among like coral rubble and on the edge of like coral rubble and sandy areas, so. Well, I found a perfect little spot right here. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, I think that was a green thing. Oh, green thing. <laughs> green thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. those tuning in, I believe we still have a few more hours left in the dive. Only uh, 10 or 15 minutes left on this watch, but uh, you can uh, stay tuned in. Our, uh, Dr. Val, has the dive plan uh, changed much from the original one? As far uh, as yeah, there have been some shifts. Uh, we have a new waypoint three that we're approaching. And so instead of uh, kind of doing a dog leg over uh, 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 to uh, the left of uh, where we're traversing and kind of going up part of that uh, uh, that poly. Um, we're, we're sticking a little closer to the ridge because uh, we uh, have been dealing with some current issues that have really slowed down Herc's movement. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, um, we're in an area uh, that gets a little bit less of that current. So we're, we're in the in the Lee area of, uh, just off a ridge and uh, traveling up that way. And then uh, um, you know, as time allows, we'll try to uh, catch back up uh, with the uh, the planned route for their uh, for their up section. Great. So yeah, it's just you know can't predict what the currents are going to be like on an unexplored seamount. So uh, that was a little issue we ran into, and it just means uh, getting a little creative and finding a, a, a more mobile pathway up on the fly. Outstanding. Done masterfully by this team. But, uh, the sixth dive on this unnamed seamount number seventeen. Papahanao Mokuakea, part of the Alao Moana Kaivuli expedition. You're about to be in the in a second. Yeah. Eight to 12 watches uh, nearly coming to a close. I, we, uh, we helped kick off this dive last night, Hawaii time. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, about 14 hours ago, a little over 14 hours ago, and uh, I think I'd still have another six or so left, to six or seven hours left to explore this seamount. Maybe I can uh, I can put in another ship move. Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. At the end of the rope. Yeah. Oh, this is stunning. Yeah. Can we uh, zoom in? Yeah, I mean. This dive has just been extraordinary, seeing all of the different sizes of the pohaku, the rocks, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the dike ridges that we've been seeing, and then just the variety, the colors of all of the corals and the associates, and the overhang, I mean, is something that's just incredible. Um, Absolutely. It's been amazing to witness, and especially after doing, um, you know, three of our archaeological dives, I think this is all what we all 
We're looking forward to seeing some beautiful mm -hmm. life, abundance and color. Yeah, this is, it's truly amazing. Um, the many layers of Papanamakuakea okay, Marine National Monument, and you know, it, it just goes to really show how this really can be a, a cultural and, you know, um, it's a, you know, it's it's one of the few cultural and ecological monuments and just mm -hmm. how important that is, um, you know, to protect. I mean, this is just pretty amazing. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah, it's great to see all this biodiversity here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Still a uh, thousand meters to go, to a uh, thousand meters up to go till we're uh, at the summit of the seamount as well. So uh, there's a lot of seamount left. Yeah, right. stay <laughs> tuned. So hopefully we'll be able to make it up there um, before end of dive. But you know, if we don't, uh, you know, that's that's just kind of how things uh, mm -hmm. happen too. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. uh, it was a bit of a struggle uh, early on in the dive once we picked up that current uh, maneuvering the vehicles. So, uh, so yeah, the current is definitely a factor on the seamount in a way that we hadn't uh, yet uh, really encountered on this expedition. Sometimes happens when you go exploring. Sure <laughs> does. <laughs> yeah, this is stunning. And we've got some crinoids there on the bottom. Yeah, just a couple of crinoids hanging out. Mm -hmm. Oh, it looks like a small paragorgid. Yeah. Just a baby. Next to the Chrysogorgia geniculata with the um, Carostelida squat lobster in it. Wow, these are stunning. This is fantastic. There are a ton of squat lobsters. You know, the only thing this dive is missing right now are some of those giant uh, polyopagon and bolosoma sponges. <laughs> and chocolate. Mm. <laughs> what? No, no chocolate. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'll take care of you next. There was watch. talk early on that somebody had a lot of chocolate. And I haven't <laughs> seen any chocolate. Someone <laughs> had chocolate? <laughs> it's day 15. Where is the chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> And it's lunchtime. <laughs> Please spill. <laughs> who has the chocolate? Speaking of candy, who had that bag of gummy bear? Oh, that was Dan. That was Dan? Ooh, yeah. yeah, I didn't have any of those. A lot of people were impressed with those things. <laughs> yes, apparently the front row has been hiding a bag of gummies. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's about a lunch You gotta raid Dan whenever he comes on the ship. <laughs> <laughs> if he comes in with it. You see, no one has touched the raisins, though. The raisin <laughs> jar. <laughs> <laughs> the, the but the fruit loops no were takers. Gone. Yeah, the fruit loops were gone in half a day. Yeah. But the raisin jar next to it still remains untouched. Un untouched. <laughs> they fooled me on the first day. I thought they were cocoa puffs. Oh, oh no. Oh, oh get oh, no. the no. Oh, oh, no. no. That. I am so sorry. There it is. Sunk to the, sunk to the bottom of the bowl of milk, yeah? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you realize. Okay. Can we put your milk in first? Uh, or no, 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 no. <laughs> cereal? Who does cereal and who does milk first? The Great Divide. I do cereal. First. Hey, on a boat, you know, you gotta be efficient. <laughs> <laughs> be efficient, move purposefully. <laughs> wow, another stunning. More. Alright, more. what's this orangey red one that's near the center? Are you talking about this one? Is that yeah. like a bubble gum? Yeah, that looks like another paragorgid or right. um, That's bubble the gum. coral I want to be. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're um, zooming in on that. <laughs> look at that. That's just great. Videographer's Very choice. <laughs> yeah. I'm in here kind of tight. I'll try to go down a little bit, maybe give it a little bit more. It takes a lot to uh, get us off our uh, common theme at the end of our morning 8 to 12 watch, which is lunch and food. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, these corals can do it. These uh, Paragorgia, Chrysogorgia is beautiful. <laughs> 
Could we also zoom in on the yellow fan to the left too, if that's possible? Okay. Oh, stunning. The gradient of color is orchid. Well, hello, Nui Loa She says that it's an acanthic orchid. Oh, wonderful. Yes, thank you so much. God. So beautiful. So beautiful here. Such abundance. And there's the the basket stars, and uh, it's like a what is that on the right? Another paragorgia on the right, and more chrysogorgias, and the those squat lobsters. Amazing. Yeah, that is a beautiful acanthic orchid. coming up on uh, a watch change here. Uh, some of the next watch is starting to come in. So um, yeah, we'll uh, get things uh, handed off, briefed, settled, and uh, then we'll be with the uh, 12 to 4 watch. So, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, you'll start hearing some new voices in the next few minutes. Mm -hmm. Amazing to be with you all. Mahalo nui. And mahalo you Mahalo yeah. yaku Thank you so much. Everyone, this has been Mahalo great. Nui, it's been a wonderful journey with you and we'll see you folks soon. Ahui ho.
Oh, we're still getting settled a bit. Roger. Neil, we've got a distance to waypoint three. Uh, one second. Thank you. Uh, just over 300 meters. Okay. It's, uh, you know, still pretty steep. Have to climb our way up meter by meter. Yeah, it takes time. Come up, but yes, it's great to be back on another shift and still get to experience this wonderful rock freeze. Yep. So we're all good? Been, yes. Ready to go? Yep. Absolutely. We're all set. Back row is good to go. Mm -hmm. We are settled in. Come on, fine. We're good for a 10 meter move or whatever they've been doing. <laughs> yes. Uh, come, come back down five for a minute. Come down another five for me. Just try and get around here. Get a shot of this tree trunk. That is quite large. Yes, that is a fairly large colony of what looks like a heming coralium, and it's covered with basket stars. Yeah, it doesn't hurt to have the lights of Atalanta in the background either. <laughs> That's interesting. Turn back up for a DSC here. I'm uh, tight to there and bouncing a little. So. Yep, had one shot in, but it's a beautiful spot. And we see lots of chrysogorgids. Uh, 
At one point I had the DSC lined up with the Zeus, but... So shot with Atalanta in the background there. To crop that out. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. No. Okay, you can come up five. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. We are just getting on the 12 to 4 watch. Um, front row and science, if it now would be an okay time for introductions, just let me know. Back row is good. Cool. Front row is good. I'll start. I'm Dan. I'm the best driver tonight. Thank you, Dan. Hi, I'm Mia. I'm serving as the navigator. Hello, I'm Jacob. I am the Atalanta pilot. Hello, my name is Jaina. I'm the video engineer on watch. Ali, my name is Elsay. I'm a supporting scientist on this watch, and I'll be covering for Kara. Uh, she just finished a ship to shore interaction, so she is eating lunch. Good afternoon. Welcome to the afternoon watch. Um, my name is Hans. I am a Archaeologist and historian for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And uh, I'm Upashana Ganguly from India, and I'm a deep sea biologist studying uh, the evolution of a group of deep sea octocorals. I'm currently a PhD student uh, at University of Louisiana at Lafayette and serving as a biologist on the team. Tiran. Hello, I'm Taylor Ann. I am the science manager and data logger on this watch. Um, I'm also a research assistant at UCLA, um, and I research microplastic pollution in the deep sea. I uh, hope you all are tuned in and excited for all these amazing corals that we're seeing. Thanks, Taylor Ann, and thanks 12 to 4 watch. Uh, we are currently diving on an unnamed sea mount in the Papa Hanamokuakea Marine National Monument. This has actually never been explored before, so we are um, here at the forefront of exploration and we're actually seeing quite a lot, a lot of biodiversity uh, on this rock face. Yeah, I see it. It's a big one. Is that a mushroom coral? Sea star. Sea star? Oh, yes. it's a really fat sea yeah, star. Yeah, that's a very big sea star. So we are currently looking at a very big colony of hemichorallium that is covered with basket stars. And at the base of it, there is a sea star which appears to be feeding on the polyps. And surrounding this almost gigantic sea fan are several chrysogorgid uh, octocorals that we can see. Uh, this is a magnificent view and we'll try to ID have a better idea on the sea star soon it's too big I can't get in there any closer mm -hmm. right it's probably in the family goniasterid And that is another sea star mm -hmm. whose arms we're seeing, or is the same one? Same I one. think the same one. Same one? Yeah. That is a big sea star. Yeah. It's very fat and happy. Try and do a uh, snap zoom there for us, Janet. Good, thanks. 
Oh, it is the same one. Yeah, that's a that's a very good view. Okay, so can be one of the solasterids. I think it is one of the solasterid sea stars. Now that we are looking, having a closer look at it, but can be a little faster, given the pattern and coloration. It can be the genus low faster. Okay, why well, thanks. Okay, we're seeing two different kinds of hemicorallium or corallium. One, I think the lighter fan, the one which is bigger in size, is probably a different species from the darker, more orange fans that we are seeing. And there's definitely lots of Chrysogorgia. Mm. I am aware that there's a new genus of Pseudochrysogorgia, but I am... I don't know how to differentiate between those two, so. Definitely in the family Chrysogorgia there. There's still some amazing topography here. Absolutely. It really is. In addition to the biological abundance, I know that Val and Hannah are very excited to still be looking into you know, what is essentially the eternal st in internal structure of this undersea volcano with this area that has, the exterior portions have collapsed away, revealing some of the internal structure like the volcanic dikes. And uh, we don't have a geologist on this watch, but we, we do our best to follow their instructions. We change leads and watches and- uh, Snap zoom on the fish. Yes, please. Yep. And uh, she'd like, you know, another rock sample above waypoint three. That is, uh, that's okay. one of the rack tails. The, um, we could use another rock. They haven't picked up any rocks. They're still very late. Yeah, it is a very interesting topology. Another interesting fact about this site is it was actually previously trawled on. Okay. Um, I don't think it, or I'm not sure if it's this area, um, but another one of the dive objectives is to just um, see if there's been um, any effects to the ecosystems from previous trawling activities. Yeah, they're so. particularly interested in the top of the seamount. Yes. It's gonna, yeah. Yeah. There's a quite Given difference in depth. Yes, and uh, yeah, the difference in depth definitely. And looking, at, that's a beautiful flight trap and enemy hanging on top of the Chrysogorgid skeleton over there, and the basket stars. Uh, yeah. So given the size and uh, the size of the sea fans that we are, we have been seeing for the last couple of hours. Uh, it doesn't look like that this these particular depths have been under the effect of trawling so much because all of these are very old uh, colonies and they because they have a very slow growth rate and it takes them years and years to attain such heights but I'm sure it's going to change we'll see a lot changing as we move gradually higher up that uh, makes sense and also it's interesting to see how the uh, community composition has changed in the last couple of hours. When we left our watch earlier in the morning, it was dominated by the big bamboo coral fans. But right now we are seeing uh, more of chrysogorgids with some uh, corallium and hemicorallium fans. And we also see an abundance of basket stars, which we did not see earlier. So it is also interesting to note how the community changes within a couple of meters of each other. Yeah, that was a tremendous bamboo fan ridge. Absolutely. Down below us. Absolutely. Come up 10 meters. And there were the big primnoid fans as well. And it will be interesting to see the top of this seabound exactly. when we make it up there for those potential impacts. Mm -hmm. The dive started somewhere around 2,600 meters depth. 
and the top is in the range of a thousand meters. Thousand, depth. I it's think eight hundred meters. Probably. Yeah, eight hundred meters. So that 16, is a, 1800 meters of elevation. Exactly. Uh, another five. So uh, load to leave that ridge. I can move the ship over there if you want. Uh, oh, I'm asking the background. Or uh, I had to step back over here to come up. To, we're getting uh So you're asking if we could, if we want to move to a, a nearby ridge? Uh, the ridge I was following, I've abandoned and I've uh, moved to the north. Probably. Uh, 20 meters to, uh, I need to come under Atlanta to come up this particular uh, feature here. Right. If you want to stay on the big corals, I would have to uh, move the ship perpendicular to our route to the waypoint. Right. My first reaction would be to continue to the waypoint, but what do you think? Yes, we can continue to the waypoint. Apostle, okay. And if we see something that is different, we can stop for quick zooms if possible. A lot of times we uh, follow our nose a little bit to stay on the bling. <coughs> There's some uh, glass sponges that we are sponging, uh, that we are crossing as <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> we are all excited and <laughs> sleep deprived. The sponges are sponging. Sponging, exactly. <laughs> There's some iridogorgias, uh, crinoids, wow. another beautiful uh, glass sponge, sacocalyx. And we are seeing ophiroids as well on a bunch of these corals. Up a bit. Sponges are sponging. I like that. <laughs> Come up just a little faster there. Mm. Right under you. So today we are diving with our two-body system, which is um, Hercules on the bottom and Atalanta on top for um, some bird's eye view support. And the advantage, or one of the advantages of Hercules is that we have two lasers that um, you can see on screen. And we had some questions in the chat earlier about size, but if we ever miss those um, viewers can also use the lasers to estimate, get a sense of scale. The two green dots are 10 centimeters apart, or about four inches in uh, imperial system measurements. There's another very beautiful hemichorallium fan with the basket stars. It is interesting that whenever we are seeing one of these fans, there is a, we are encountering also a larger number of basket stars, which are on them and also on the chrysogorgids around them. Uh, but we are not seeing so many when we are moving away from those ha uh, big hemichorallium or corallium fans. Opashana, so... Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh